I believe that we all as a humans, we tend to forget things, not because it's a natural thing to happen, it's more of a choice. We choose to forget the things that don't matter to us and we hold so tight into those memories that meant something in our lives. And it doesn't matter if it's a happy or ugly memory, it's just a choice we make. So as for me, when it comes to experiencing the war in Yemen, I have those memories that I can never ever see myself without. They are reflected in my work, in the way how I present myself, and somehow I feel they shape my identity today. So today I'm really keen to share with you five memories or five lessons of what is it really like to be a woman in Yemen. So let's begin with lesson number five. You know the saying that chocolate makes things better? It's not a cliche, it's a fact. You know when I, the word used to get upside down and when it used to rain bombs, I used to pray so hard that this country, Yemen, will never ever run out of chocolate or Nutella for that matter. Because they still give you that sweet, sensational, almost illusional feeling that the things are fine. Calm down, Fana. It worked, by the way. Number four, and this is an advice I tell my friends in Yemen, never ever plan your wedding during a wartime. Why? You end up on a honeymoon like the one I had. My husband and I sleeping in this corner here between the kitchen and the bathroom to avoid shattered window glass panes from shattering over in us. My husband's looking at me with the evil eye. Did you show this photo? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Speaking of shatter window glass, you know those who came up with the idea that taped windows can prevent the shattering are wrong. I used to tape and tape and tape. It's a complete waste of time. Just imagine if you have party poppers and you try to twist them. That's the sort of reaction you get. I mean, even a bullet found its way to our apartment. Number three, um, and two, and this was a moment of realization for me. The moment you feel you are helplessly weak, you are terrified of losing your life and the lives of those who you care about. You feel that you cannot take another step because everything else is beyond your control. Believe me, it's that same exact moment where you would feel, well, there's nothing, nothing wrong to just fake being strong. Because what other choices you have? None. And this leads me to lesson number one. I learned that ordinary people can be heroes and that superheroes do exist. In the case of Yemen, let me tell you, women are the superheroes. They are the unsung heroines who would always fake being strong, even if they just, you know, pretend, like my mom, who pretends that everything is fine when I call her, but she struggles to sleep at night as all means of survival are either in shortage or don't exist anymore. Speaking here of water, electricity, food, medicine, you name them. And I won't talk figures today. I'm really, really exhausted about seeing these people in numbers and press in media today. I am exhausted more to see the response becoming so numbed about it. And I won't blame the word. I won't blame you guys. I mean, how would I expect you to react for something you have not experienced before? I mean, what do you know about waking up one day without, you know, home, food, nothing? So during this journey, and as a photographer documenting the humanitarian situation in Yemen, I did not want to talk to politicians, leaders, media people, none. Simply for two reasons. One, I am a very simple, less complicated person who overconsumes chocolate and coffee. Two, I wanted to talk to the women, uh, the women in their households, the ones who would do whatever they can to put food on the table. And also, I really wanted to share my struggle with them. I wanted to have that women-to-woman -woman talk. So I talked to everyone, including the women in my family, the women in the neighborhood, the women in the streets, the women in the displaced camp. And I think I've seen it, not all, but really all. I've seen Katiba, who can't afford to go to the hospital. I've seen Omsad, who lost a child. I've seen Nama who had to flee her house. 
I've seen Halima, whose her house was destroyed. I left the house for a few hours, few hours. Then when I came back, it was all gone. The next day I found Halima like that, watering her plants. What are you doing, Halima? Well, Thana, I cannot let my precious, poor plants die. That's the spirit I learned. I've seen Om Nawal, a mother of two girls, both of whom face med medical issues with their kidneys. They can afford to go to the hospital and she takes care of her grandchildren and her husband who does not provide to the house anymore because he lost his job. And one time I asked her, what's the magic? How do you do it? And that was her response to me. So later on, I started um, going to displaced camps in Khamer and Amran city, just near Sana city. And as I was walking in the camps, you know, I wondered what sort of bad time stories do mom tell their children here? What sort of fairy tales? Are they happy ones? Can they afford to tell happy stories? Later on, I came up you know, upon this story that I'll never ever forget. I came upon this old woman who invited me to her tent to see her Hafsa, her daughter-in-law. Hafsa had just delivered the baby the night before. Um, this is Hafsa. And so you see in the camps, there are no clinics, no doctors, nothing. Hafsa had to travel to the nearest hospital to deliver the baby. And then I was chatting with Hafsa, you know, uh, telling her what I'm doing, why I'm doing here, what I'm doing here with my cameras. And it wasn't actually about the cameras. It was me really wanting to know about Hafsa. So I had, a, I had this casual chat with Hafsa and then I asked her, what did you name your baby? She was a baby girl. And I asked her, what did you name your baby girl? She said, uh, Malaka. Malaka in English is spoon. And I laughed immediately. I was like, how do you name your child Spoon Malaga? That's a crime for me. So she laughed as well. She doesn't talk much, but she laughed at that moment. She said, well, I was hungry. I mean, I was starving. So that's why I kept thinking, thinking, okay, I'm just gonna name my baby Malaka Spoon. And I left Yemen two years ago, and I keep thinking of Malaka nowadays. Is she hungry? Because Hafsa told me I named her Spoon because I don't want her to have my life ever. I don't want her to be hungry. I don't know the fate of Hafsa or her daughter anymore. As I'm telling you these stories, there are a lot of unheard voices in Yemen. Women who rely solely on hope and faith to manage their limitations. I don't doubt that they will continue. They will still tape their windows. They will still fall in love, get married, have children. They will fight for their survivals, for their life, and for the lives of those whom they care about. Because that's what superheroes do, right? But I have this scary thought in mind. What if these women stop? What if they reach their limits? I mean, even hope has got the limit. You know, in spite of everything, everything wrong in Yemen, I believe it's still standing because, because these women and others are very busy glowing the broken pieces together. But what if they run out of options? What if they give up? Not only we're gonna witness stressful tragedy, but I feel like it's gonna be a goal that we'll never ever forgive ourselves for. So those were my five lessons or five memories. But if there's one thing I want you to take with you today, don't just admire those women. Don't admire the resilience. I mean, thank you for doing that if you already admire their strengths. This is important for you to do that. But they need more. They need us to stand with them, empower them, relieve them from their pain, because they deserve that. So, Om Nawal, when I photographed her, or when I approached her to photograph her, she ha was really hesitant. She told me, Thana, no, I don't want to do it. Of course, she was shy. But there was one reason she told me that 
I can't do it because do they even care? Do they even know ab about us? And I told her, well, let's try. So today I urge you to prove me right, that we all care. Thank you so much.